Welcome. Uh, Nahu Mikey P here, Mike Probozzi. I'm not PTF. Uh, PTF is in London and was on his way back today, but uh, he couldn't quite make it. So uh, it is the opening day of baseball. Uh, called to the bullpen. Uh, normally, I know I'm a harness guy, but uh, now I'm starting to do some thoroughbred podcasts and uh, it's uh, really cool to be here. This is the uh, Florida Derby live stream. Uh, they're going over the Florida Derby card for Saturday. And a couple very uh, expert handicapping minds here to help me. And uh, to start, I, I did a, a pod with him not too long ago. Just got to meet him. Uh, somebody that I'm very fond of as far as his analysis. Uh, it's Mr. Nick Tamara. Welcome, Nick. Mike, good to see you and uh, good to be here. Glad to join you again, Brian, as well for this uh, this Florida Derby handicapping round. And also Nick mentioned Brian here. Uh and someone that's obviously uh, tied into Gulfstream, uh, all over the Gulfstream broadcast. Uh, Brian, and do welcome. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Nick. Always good to see you, bud. Uh, yeah, it's just an exciting weekend down here. We've got 14 really strong races. Uh, on Saturday, the end of the championship meet, well, Sunday with the big rainbow, actually. But uh, Curl in Florida Derby Day, it should be pretty cool. And I think uh, we'll get into it. But I think we've got a pretty compelling race on our hands, too, with you know, a few different ways you could go as well. So looking forward to hearing some opinions from uh, from both of you guys. That's exciting. Uh, and we're presented by First Racing. We, we thank them for their sponsorship. We're going to look at late pick five here. And uh, it's a million dollar guarantee. We might give you a couple spot plays toward the end if you can hang with us. But this, uh, this late pick five starts out in race number 10. We're going to go races 10 through 14. Uh, lots of stakes here. Starts out on the grass. The grade three uh, orchid stakes that go a mile and a half on the grass. And uh, this is a nice race. Nick, what did you think here to, to get this pick five started? You know, this is a tough way to get it started, uh, to be perfectly honest. I thought there were really a, a couple of options. The three, R. Kelly Kim is out. She was a program scratch. She's actually been retired. And, you know, I, I think when push comes to shove, the winner probably comes from the three horse group of the one, four, and six. That's uh, La Mahana, who is first time in North America for Christophe Clement, as well as the four, surprisingly, in the six, McCulloch. They're the three favorites. I don't have anything overly clever in terms of other horses to use. I think you are probably a little bit more inclined to give a longer look to a horse like McCulloch because she can kind of make her own luck a little bit more. But we also don't really know what surprisingly his running style is going to look like at a distance like a mile and a half because she spent the entirety of her career going shorter. And this is going to be a race that's obviously run at a significantly slower early pace. And I think that is going to enable her to race a little bit more forwardly. I thought she ran very well in the Pegasus World Cup Philly and Mare Turf, uh, making a big, strong late move up the inside to narrowly miss. And now she comes back off a short break. It, you know, it's a little surprising to me that Todd is going to a marathon race. You would almost wonder if they would have considered a race like the Jenny Wiley. Um I'd like to go so far as to say that's probably kind of a vote of no confidence. So I think it kind of makes me prefer La Mahana and McCulloch. Um, La Mahana is sort of the unknown quantity, but I'd love to hear if, if Brian's got anybody clever. I don't love those three, but I think the winner comes from those three. It, it's hard to go outside of there, isn't there? Because the quality of those three, it, it just seems to tower um, over the, the rest of them, you know, I, maybe line right that but the point is those three on the betting line are going to be so far above everyone else um i'm you know nick kind of hit hit on it a little bit he made a good point about the, the wiley i never thought of that my point was if surprisingly runs 50 more times in her life she'll never get a better trip than she got in the pegasus you said it nick she came right up the fence there was never a straw in her path she was you know, first time Todd, I know I know it was the Pegasus, but she was almost 30 to one. They didn't bet her. She was almost an afterthought. Um, I've just got to see more from from her. Or I see, maybe I should say I have to see it again. How about that? Yeah. That's probably a better way to put it. La Mahana, we don't really know what, what she's going to bring. I mean, the, the group one at, at Longchamp, um, you know, that's not the Prix de Lopro. Let's not forget. That's the I don't want to disparage a group one race over there, uh, you know, but that's not the the race. It's at a mile and three quarters. I'm a little suspect uh, of her going. This is going to be fast on Saturday, not necessarily the pace, but the turf course. How is she going to handle it? 
So, you know, it's kind of an auto default, but, you know, McCulloch looks pretty salty to me. And I, I'm 6'1 with, with a little backup with surprisingly anybody else. And, and again, Nick kind of hit on it. Anybody else is I'm probably scratching my head at. We did have a, a replay queued up for it, surprisingly. She, I thought she got a, one of those all-time uh, great rides, really. I mean, started in the, in the outside post and ended up inside, had really not a straw in her path and was able to, you know, nearly win the race. I mean, she was that was a perfect ride, like you said, perfect trip. So I think she has questions. Uh, La Mahana has questions. Although, if you watch that replay from that grade one at Longstrap, she was close to the pace that day. And, and that was a, a rough race. I thought she held on pretty well. And, you know, Christoph, when, when he brings them over... You know, I think the distance will suit her much better than most of these. And then you have the, the the Chad factor. Yes, he can bring them off layoffs, but this horse hasn't been seen since November. Didn't exactly tear it up in the Breeders' Cup either, uh, McCulloch. So there's questions with all of them, all those big favorites there. So it's it's going to be an interesting race. Let's yeah, go McCulloch's to race also 11. not. I mean, to be to be perfectly honest, she's really not very good either. Yeah, I think I, mean, I think she's just. I think she's just a lot. I think she's better than these horses. Um, I mean, she did spend the majority of last year running against better horses, but I mean, her, her loss to Parnak in the flower bowl, uh, other than understanding that they let Parnak kind of get away with murder on the front end, that was a pretty embarrassing defeat, yeah. right. For, to a horse that she absolutely should have beaten. So, I mean, if Mikula comes with some kind of quasi meaningless late run to, to finish second or third, I'm not going to be surprised because she's, she's made hard work of it in a number of winnable spots in the past. Absolutely. I, I just think that that is a tough race. I mean, the, one of the favorites are probably supposed to win, but uh, good luck figuring out whose day it is, I think. OK, so the 11th race, uh, this is grade two, Gulfstream Park Oaks, obviously prep uh, for the Kentucky Oaks. And uh, a lot of uh, questions here with the, the return of, of Wayne's ways and means. And, and uh, she had trouble in that spin away, that blowout maiden win. Uh, Brian, what do you think? Are you for or against this favorite? Well, I'll say this, Mike. I, I didn't pick her on top just because I, I think in the perfect world, they would love to get her to the Kentucky Oaks. I think the fact that she's coming back at two turns in the Gulfstream Park Oaks says they're aiming for the Oaks. Um, so I went with a recency edge on, on another horse. With all of that being said, because I think we're going to show the spin away. Things didn't go her way that day. She is so much better than this group. And you can kind of see what's going on here. She, she's just really, really uh, a talented filly. And uh, uh, Gunsong is my pick. I'm, a, I'm really against the Devona Dale horses. I think that's, to me, what I really want to try to take advantage of. Some of the Devona Dale horses, I, I, I don't really like that race at all. Yeah, that replay there. I think that was towards the end of the race. She had trouble early, ways and yeah. means, in, in the, the first quarter of that race and, and basically got sawed off early. Uh, but the, the, the talent is, I think, superior. But how is she going to go from two to three? I mean, there's a lot of new things here. And the big the big goal is is several weeks from now. So uh, and, uh, you know, the rest of them sort of look the same to me, Nick. I don't yeah. know what you think. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, and, and I think by the same, you mean probably not quite good enough. Right. Is, is the, the, the sort of interpretation, um, because what we don't know is what we're going to be dealing with in terms of ways and means having matured. Right. You're talking about a, a filly that was clearly way ahead of the curve. I mean, when she broke her maiden, you could tell from a physical perspective, she was just way advanced relative to the other horses and and just blew their doors off, came back and ran a bang up race in the spin away to what was probably the best you know, one turn two year old Philly last year, bright work wasn't quite able to stretch out. Um, th the thing to me that's worth noting is that if Chad was going to be more conservative with ways and means they could have run in the Beaumont and they could have tried to go to the eight bells and then maybe work their way up to the acorn or something like that. The fact that he's willing to send her here going two turns off the layoff, I think is probably a, in, in this case, it's a pretty big vote of confidence. And the mile and a 16th suits are a little bit better than going up to a race like the gazelle and going a full mile and an eighth off the layoff. She is, she looks to be based on what we saw last year, based on the pedigree, she should be able to go long. I mean, obviously more of the distance will come from the dam side, but I'm, I can't wait to see it. Right. I can't wait to find out if she's gotten better because quite honestly, I mean, no matter what speed figure you use, she was way faster than these horses as a two-year-old. 
So, yeah. I mean, if she's, if we're supposed to look at how she's matured, how she's developed, I mean, she has the potential to be way better than all of them. Brian's pick gun song feels like the alternative, you know, the, the question that you ask yourself with Gunsong is what is it about her last two races that has really brought out her very best? Is it dry tracks? Is it Lasix? Is it South Florida? Is it some combination of the three? Because she's only going to get one of those, right? She's not going to get all of them. She's going to go, well, she's going to get a fast track and she's still in South Florida. So I should say, so she's going to get two, but she's not going to probably get a very easy lead. She's going to have to deal with other pace pressure and she's facing better horses than she has so far. I don't want to shortchange her. I think that Catherine wheel is a solid horse and she really, she really pounded her last time out. So I think Gunsong has a lot of upside. I agree with the sentiment on the Devona Dale the only horse I could be talked into is into champagne just Agreed. because Ian Wilkes is a guy that he's going to take those horses along slowly. You know, he's going to let them mature. She isn't into mischief. So she, there's no surprise. She was precocious, but I don't know. She doesn't exactly warm my heart as a horse that's getting better at a mile and a 16th. It felt like she kind of shortened up a little bit late last time out. And Fiona's magic has a lot of the same kind of look of like a Darth Vader from last year that really excelled at the mile, but will probably always struggle at anything beyond that. Two questions. One into champagne. She sort of looked like she was loaded and, and was going to win easy. And then all of a sudden just kind of stayed right where she was. What did you think of that effort? And any love for a do-gooder at all? Uh, you know, coming off the the uh, the maiden win and the the monsoon there on February eighteenth. I mean, her her pace figures are are you know pretty significantly higher than most of these, uh, and she could improve. You know, we can see what what Jenna Antonucci can do with a good horse. Also, I, I feel like this horse a ten to one morning line could be very interesting. I'll say this: We, sh I, I should have mentioned at the start. We, we both know this, but just to everybody, short stretch finish line here. Okay, that's a very, um, and it's not the truest race. Okay, and so if you're if you're thinking do gooder, isn't she supposed to be in front if nothing mm -hmm. else? And I've said it ad nauseum. I always go back to promises fulfilled. I mean, promises fulfilled won the Fountain of Youth. Promises could fulfilled couldn't get a two turn win. You know, if they dropped them off in a van at the top of the stretch. You get to the far turn, though, if you're in front, it's a very short stretch and short finish line. If you're a do-gooder fan, the path to victory is on the front end. And, you know, Nick and I have kind of alluded to it. I don't know how good the chasers are out of the Devona Dale and things like that. If Ways and Means needs one, if she stubs her toe, if Gunsong's a Lasix horse. Hey, who knows? You could get brave in here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of my thought. Um, you know, do-gooder, the reports prior to her debut was that she was training like a, a monster. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the reason why she went off the favorite in a in a pretty good-looking field on paper. And, you know, I, I thought she ran very well last time out. She is, uh, as you mentioned, Mike, she's a pace figure horse in that I think her, her buyer figures don't really indicate how well she ran. And I don't really rate her much lower than a horse like... Uh, uh, like Gunsong in terms of, of where she is at speed figure wise. And I think she's dangerous as well. And like Brian said, I mean, you're just supposed to make this about a race to the first turn to your first question. I think what you laid out with into champagne, looking like she was loaded and then coming up short is probably the biggest illustration of a horse with distance limitations you're ever going to find. Hmm. Right. She just couldn't get that last eighth after getting herself into a really advantageous spot. So I think there's uh, there's a lot of lot of concern there about how far she wants to go. And, you know, I think what you don't the problem into champagne runs into in a race like this is that I don't know if you want to position yourself to kind of pick up the baton with three furlongs to go. If do good or somehow can't get the trip or maybe she needed Lasix or something along those lines, because then you're going to have fresh challenges late. And it feels like a situation where she's going to run herself into potentially a great deal of trouble um getting that getting that distance all right we move on to race number 12 and this is the sand springs on the grass again uh mile is 16th last year's winner is in here and that's the number eight uh market segmentation and uh another one for chad coming back loves golf stream park two for two nick uh for or against this favorite so I actually took a little swing against. I picked Infinite Diamond. Um, I, I think there's got to be a price in here somewhere, although I, I had a dopey idea in the race, that the Philly race on turf last time, and that didn't come to fruition. But um, I, I actually think Infinite Diamond's turf races, if you pick them apart one by one, they've actually all been very good. And I think this might be a Paco type of horse that gets you know kind of stashed in behind close to the lead and maybe is able to score a slight upset. 
market segmentation to me can can certainly win this race. She's a bit of a phony though. I mean that that win in the in the New York was earned on the front end on a rail on a, uh, a turf course where the rail had been taken down. You know, we've all been saying for years when they take the rail down on the the inner turf at Belmont on Belmont weekend and we won't have to worry about this for a few years. Uh the the inside was just a lightning lane. So, you know, I don't want to I don't want to make more of that market segmentation win than than it really deserves. And when you start to really kind of dig through it, you know, she won the Sand Springs last year and the horses that were the also rans, you'd have to kind of look up to them up to remember who they are. So it's a it's a situation where she's going to be over bet relative to her chances of winning. I actually think that Infinite Diamond and Cairo Consort are, are equally as likely to win. And I think Cairo Consort is uh, is actually coming out of a better race than people realize mm-hmm. in that third place finish behind our Kelly Kim at a trip that probably was a little bit beyond where she wants to go distance wise. So I, I felt like this was maybe an opportunity to go for a slight upset. Brian. Well, it, it's, it's funny now we're on the third race of the sequence and we've talked now, this will be the third Chad and Seth Klarman horse that we've talked about all coming off significant layoffs too. And I, I should have jumped in at the start. Nick knows this, Mike, you know, too. the Chad horses have not all been overly live off mm-hmm. the, the long layoffs. It's a means to an end. Maybe it is on Saturday. I don't know. They might all be better than the rest too. I think that's, that's something as gamblers, we're all going to have to kind of figure out there are bigger goals down the line. So we have to think about that. Um, Nick said it perfectly. Uh, the, the, the faux pas in the New York was on the six other jockeys who let her walk on the front end as well. Um, she won this race last year. She made a heck of a hard work of it. That's for sure. Um, but geez, again, she might just be better than these. The only funky idea, uh, Nick's right. Infinite diamond ran big last time. She was 40 to one. I actually talked to Andy B and Cone today. She ran big and she's probably Nick supposed to two path stock, almost like a harness trip of the three in here and get first run over a fast, firm turf course. I can, I can see what you're doing. My, I don't know how kooky of an idea it was candy light. I don't know where she was going to finish last time, but boy, oh boy, did she get stopped on a dime in the lane trying to come up the inside. It just didn't work out. Edgar Zayas, We'll get a board today. She might not be good enough. I, I don't know. I will say this, The Last time was her first turf start for Safi, and she was going to move forward in a big, big way. She didn't get the chance to show how much forward. She's my other A in here, but and that's partly because I don't want, you know, odds on or even money on, on market segmentation, unfortunately. I want to ask both you guys, uh, Brian, you can start first, but when you're playing pick fives like this and, and you yeah. have suspect favorites and, and like, wh- what's your style? Are you, are you more, are you trying to, to go for like a kill shot, maybe with a, a candy light in, in a race like this and, and try to spread around that one or, or something like that? Are you more trying to just pitching favorites all together? Uh, what do you, what do you think? I think it depends on, a couple of these favorites, ways and means especially, I think it depends on how much you really dislike them. I don't want to pick market segmentation, but I also don't want to use five horses against her, so I'm going to pick one. That's how I kind of look at it. If I can get tight in other sequence, other races on the sequence, maybe I'll hit an all ball and hope for chaos because I can be really tight in the rest of them. But in something like this where, okay, I don't, I don't want her at a short number, the other problem is, and maybe Nick can talk about this too. It's like if it's not her, well, well, who is it? That that's can be a little tricky as handicappers too. Oh, great! I hated the favorite, but I went three deep and didn't have the the, the right horse. That that can be problematic too. Um, this one, this particular one, I'm just gonna go w- with Candy Light. But you know, in 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 some of these mm-hmm. other races, if it could be chaotic and you really don't like a favorite, then I am gonna spread pretty thick. Yeah, I think the mistake you can make and the, the erroneous approach to this is to say, oh, I have to toss the favorite, Yeah. Um, which you don't. You know, you want to you don't want to lose because you tossed a logical winner, um, especially if you have good opinions elsewhere. Now, this yes. is a sequence have where two seven could ones be, in the sequence. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I mean, we could you know, one of the one of the better pick fives I hit in 2018 was with a, in a sequence where the first winner was one to five. Hmm. So, I mean, you know, it's, it, it, it happens, right. It's, it's going to happen pretty frequently. Um, so it just depends on how you're structuring your whole, your whole sequence. You know, if this is a race where I'm not saying to you, I don't think market segmentation can win. What I'm saying is that I would structure my intra race plays around infinite diamond and Cairo consort, but I would be, I would be foolish to omit 
market segmentation on my pick fives, you know, I might want to, I might want to fire some kill shot pick fives that do focus more on, um, on the six and seven and really relegate her to more of a, of a mid range type of use. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it styles, especially when you're betting, uh, it matters a lot and, and, you know, you have to kind of, you know, uh, I think press your opinions and in races like this, I mean, a lot of people are going to spread, I think, uh, especially with, you know, just the race looks pretty wide open. Uh, you know, you have a favorite that, you know, is, is did win this last year, but is, is, you know, vulnerable. I think it's seven to five on that morning line. Uh, so this could be a spread race. So uh, I agree with Brian, like taking that, that kill shot. If you like one in here, single or, you know, just one or two deep here and, and spread around that one, trying to score that way. All right, race 13, we're moving on. Uh, we're getting close to the big race, but this is another turf race. It's $150,000 Appleton. They're going a mile on the grass. And uh, Nick, I thought this was a good race. Uh, I thought you could maybe get creative, get some prices here. What did you think? Yeah, I thought I thought there was some potential for it. You know, I I don't particularly trust the horse that I picked, uh, the three ice chocolat, um, but I do think he's the horse to beat. I think his turf races in terms of a whole body of work are probably better than the majority of his rivals. Um, I, I also admit that I'm not a particularly big, big Everest fan. And so that might be kind of coloring my, my opinion of him a little bit. Um, he's a horse who was, was kind of a, he was kind of a phony last year, to be perfectly honest. And the Artie Schiller was a, it was a weak race and he got a very soft trip. But, you know, if you wanted to say to me, hey, I think he's going to get a soft trip again, I I'm not going to make a huge argument against it. I do think there's going to be some pace in here. Now, I'm assuming Lucky Score is going to come out so that he'll go on Sunday when he's re-entered. Uh, but it still feels like there's enough pace in here to set the table for an off-the-pace horse. But I would imagine Saratoga Flash is going to show some speed. Obviously, Big Everest has to be somewhat forwardly placed. So I picked I Shoke a lot. Again, I don't, I don't have a... I don't have a huge lean on him. I would definitely use smoke and tea as well. I want to give him another chance. I thought he may have needed his last start off the layoff and should McGahey over the years has good second off the layoff numbers. I wanted to make Churchtown on the outside, but I went back and watched that replay and thought to myself, holy hell, he had a great trip. I mean, he really saved ground, looked like he was going to make a move up the inside, really spun his wheels late. I, 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 uh, it's I'd be hard pressed to see how he's going to turn things around after that type of effort. So mainly, uh, mainly threes and nines for me here. Brian, any love for the rail horse? Um, no. Okay. No, I went so deep. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. Um, uh, so that I guess that's be hard and firm. No, I'm with Nick on on ice shock a lot. I don't love him. I went I went seven deep in here. Uh, this I. I Kind of feel like this is the one race. We're not trying to blow it up at nine to two. Nick's a morning line maker. It's a fun race, huh, Nick? Make a line for this race. Um, hey, it's, it's bad morning line hunting season. Opens Monday with Keeneland. Ah, uh, there. Week. Go. Yeah, you got duty. Yeah, you got morning right. line police. You got that's duty. Right. Um, I got nothing clever here. I think Nick's right. Big Everest is an aqueduct horse. He's like the the turf version of Congaree or something. I don't know. He never does much outside of aqueduct. Um. I, I'll, I'll say this, if, just to talk about your horse, because Nick talked about I shock a lot. Uh, County Finals in pretty good form. Tapita, he's got a good post as well. I agree with what Nick, the premise that Nick laid down, that there's should be, in theory, some speed in this race. The one horse I want to mention, I put him in second. I have to be honest, I was blown away by the effort of never surprised off a crazy layoff. I, I feel like I had him as a 7-2 to two favorite that day. And this is a horse that ran second in the Pegasus, and he was seven to one in a silly allowance race. Uh, they didn't bet him. Obviously, he needed the race. He ran so much to me better than Quality G. I readily, I don't think anything of Quality G. So that's probably not going to flatter. Never surprised, but I think in theory he's supposed to move forward. Boy, it's a deep. This is the one spread race for me that. I want to backtrack for a quick second, Mike. You mentioned how do you play a pick five and stuff. Let, let's just say, like, if you love a market segmentation and, you know, you know she's going to be a short number, you dar and, you're, and you're playing a big ticket, you darn well better be right in other races that you think might blow up because when you single a heavy favorite like that and he or she wins, you're going to need prices because everybody else in the 50-cent era 
is singling two on a budget. So this to me is the one race in the sequence that I, I'm at least I'm not getting overly creative, but I'll have most of them in here that have any sort of turf form with, with them. Well, no love for the one, but I'll uh, I'll touch on them just a little bit here. Uh, if you look back, that Kentucky Downs race, I mean, that's a 101 uh, fig there uh, for that race. And that was a fast pace, got a, got a perfect trip. But any horse that's able to go and win there on the grass, I'm okay with. And, uh, you know, they like that race so much, they shipped to Woodbine. And, and the horse was four to one against Big Invasion. So there's no Big Invasions in this race. And I realize that he's been living on synthetics. But that was a nice race last time also on January 27th. I mean, that horse was loaded the entire way around and flew late to win. Uh, you could do worse in this race than than the one at 12 to one morning line. So I do think it's wide open. But uh, that's that's one that I am interested in, even if you guys aren't. Listen, it's a type of spot where you're allowed to be creative. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. You've got a good price. Take a shot in this type of spot. Yeah, no argument from me. Going to save ground throughout, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the big one here. Uh, the grade one, Curlin, Florida Derby. And, uh, I mean, the Kentucky Derby's getting close. I mean, it's, here we, we're already headed into April. And, uh, you know, Florida Derby, huge prep race. The winners and the, the second place finishers of this race will be should be in the gates uh, on that first Saturday in May. And and this is a tough race here. You have to decide, are you pro fierceness? Are you against fierceness? Uh, you know, obviously going to be favored again. I mean, off his big figures and, and he's the two year old champ. You have to decide what you think of the Fountain of Youth race. Uh, Brian, what say you in this race? Um, yeah, it's interesting, right? I'm a little against Hades. Back to, you mentioned, Mike, the Fountain of Youth and the Holy Bull applies as well. Again, short stretch finish line races. That's out the window now on Saturday. It's a proper two-term, mile and an eighth with the proper stretch run. Um, it's tough to knock Hades. He's undefeated. If you watch his races, he gallops out better than everybody. He wants to run on. I just kind of feel like it's going to be a little bit of a difficult, uh, road to hoe to, to the path to victory for him. He's going to be the inside speed. Maybe he's a controlling speed. I'm going to assume fierceness breaks today or on Saturday and, and John Velasquez won't let him get too, too far away. Um, I, I don't know what to make of fierceness. He was dreadful. Are we going to show it? He was absolutely dreadful in the Holy Bull. I don't care anything about the star. He's one to a hundred right here, by the way. And he finishes third. I mean, that's, can't you at least, <laughs> I don't know. Can't you do better than that? He's got a, such a Jekyll and Hyde feel to him. Um, I don't know if Conquest Warrior is good enough. He's a little slow on paper, but he's got a nine furlong win at Gulfstream. I think that's a big deal. And I just feel like he's the true two-turn nine furlong horse. I feel like he's get this reputation where he's going to be way out the back. I don't see that at all. I mean, he was very, he was plenty close enough when they went 47 and three in the allowance win last time. How much, they're not going to go any faster than this uh, on, on Saturday. He's got the ability to be close throughout. You can see him. He's going to stride out nicely. He's not going to wow anyone. He's, he's not, you know, he's not very sexy on, on paper at, at all, but I, I kind of feel like he, he gets the best of it. Um, in this spot, at least just if nothing else, in terms of of the, the 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 race itself. I mean, he did run pretty fast on the sheets, where you know Hades he hasn't broken any stopwatches. Let's just be perfectly honest. So um, it's not a strong opinion. I, the only real opinion I have, at least on the top line, is being against Hades. I'd love love to give you something clever and out of the box. I, I don't really have it. I don't really see it like that. I'll throw it to Nick. I think the three favorites, like we started the pick five. I think these three favorites, one of them are supposed to win. Yeah. I mean, look, what you want to charge conquest warrior with is that he's slow, but you look through the field and you realize that they're, they're all slow, right? I mean, save well, two races from fierceness that, that, you know, uh, seemed, uh, I don't know who, I don't know who the real fierceness is, right? I, I don't know. I don't know if what I sat and watched at the Breeders' Cup last year was a figment of my imagination. So, I mean, because that, the horse that ran it in the Holy Bull, 
as Brian said, was awful. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was an atrocious performance. I know everybody's been talking up how well he's been training. He's a, he's clearly a very good workhorse. Um, I don't want to call him a morning glory because he does have some afternoon performances that are obviously exceptional, especially in this crop. But you know, this is one of the most interesting horses we've seen in a prep race for the Derby in a very long time, because I mean, we just have no idea who he is. What we know is that if the fierceness that we saw in the Breeders' Cup and in his debut at Saratoga shows up, well, these horses are clearly all running for second. I mean, there's no no doubt whatsoever about who will win this race. But, I mean, how can you have an overwhelming amount of confidence that that's even going to happen? So I can't see Hades improving enough to wire this field. I think there's enough kind of cheap-ish speed to, to make that task a little bit too tall. And... You know, outside of that, I think the horses that you're you're looking at are the clunk up types. Um, if you're trying to, to go a different direction than Conquest Warrior, so I mean, I think intra race, I'm going to play the ten over the four, five, and six a little bit. I might play Conquest Warrior in the second spot, and those horses third underneath Fierceness. Um, but I'm really going to try and, and and hit one of them in the exact underneath Fierceness because I think he'll win. I mean, I I do think that Todd will get him right enough. Um, to, to get the job done. Hopefully they've identified a little bit about what maybe was the issue in the, in the Holy Bull because watching the race and on paper and everything else that we saw, there was no issue, right? The, the stuff about the, and, and quite honestly, I think the chart caller did the betting public a disservice with the pinballed start. I mean, I've seen horses get pinballed at the start. This horse really didn't lose any significant amount of ground. And he, his, his wounds coming out of the gate were self-inflicted in my opinion, because he broke flat footed. And there's a difference between a horse that breaks with the pack and gets sandwiched and a horse that breaks slowly and then has contact made with him on either side of him. And he did not leave with that same first step that a lot of his rivals did. And that's what put him in a negative position. So generally I'm also of the belief that when a horse doesn't break with a great amount of alacrity, it's because they're not in form. So we'll see. It's a, it's a really compelling situation because of the way he ran last time out. And, um, and we're going to learn a lot about him and everybody else in here. I have two questions. Uh, I mean, how does the race set up? I know that's a difficult question, but I mean, really, really, you know, fierceness's best races have been on the front. And now are they, are they plan to go? Do they plan to, you know, take this race, um, you know, by the horns and go and, and just be in front early, no matter the cost. I mean, Hades doesn't seem like the type of horse that wants to let other horses in front of him uh, early or late. So if those two go at it, ding dong, the race, you know, could get crazy and anything could win. I think. Um, I don't see, I'll be very surprised if Hades is not in front. It's Paco mm -hmm. uh, inside. Uh, I don't see any scenario where he's not in front. But, Mike, to pick up kind of what you were putting down, listen, John Velasquez is in the Hall of Fame for a lot of different reasons. But for two-path pressing on the outside might be one of the top ones at the list. And, you know, Todd Pletcher helped put him in there. And that's that's this horse. That's what he's supposed to do from this post position. I, I, I You have to look at the race. So you have to assume he's going to break. He's got to be used from out there. So I can see exactly what you're, the scenario you're kind of laying down, Mike, in that, yeah, they could hook up a little bit in here. They could hook up early. They could hook up often. And then maybe, you know, all bets are off. Something gets really, really funky. You know, there are – just have to see how it plays out. But it, that's a distinct possibility. And that's actually the reason why the fade for me here is Hades because, as I, I said at the start, if he's going to be inside and the theory is fierceness is going to break. And Nick, I couldn't even say it any better than Nick – he said it perfectly. Just go back and watch the race. There was nothing. My first line in my trip notes was there was nothing to see at the start. He just, I had the word lethargic in my, my trip notes. I, I, that start didn't cost him anything. As I said, he was one to a hundred on the far turn. Whatever reason, he couldn't see it out. But let's assume we get the right fierceness. That's a problem for Hades the entire way. I'm not sold on Hades wanting to go this far either that's a to me that's a real problem for him on the outside with the best horse maybe in the crop maybe the race maybe well whoever knows but the real fierceness if he shows up that that's going to be a problem for hades yeah i don't see hades getting a, a piece of this really under any circumstances and you know i think one of the things and brian said it well that uh, one of the things that John Velasquez has excelled at in his career is that outside pressing trip. One of the other things Johnny's very good at, and I would say reference like the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint from 2020, that was a situation where um, he was on Gamine and Serengeti Empress was 
was expected to be the pace setter and was looked at by a lot of people as a very dangerous horse, maybe just going out and, and throwing down fractions and being able to bottom everybody out. And when they left the gate, John Velasquez rode Gamin very hard. And what he was attempting to do was make Serengeti Empress work harder to get in front and to stay in front. And I think that's exactly what he's going to do, provided fierceness breaks with a little bit more willingness than he did last time. He wants to use his mount to make Hades work for it. And, and last time out, I think part of the issue was that, and I wonder if it also maybe contributed to, to his, uh, to him being a little lethargic was they went very slow on the front end. They didn't exactly burn up the track on in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, but they went very slow to the half mile last time. And a lot of times these super quick horses really can't get into any kind of rhythm when they're being backed down so much. So, I mean, I think Johnny has to use every bit of the natural speed that this horse possesses. I think he really ended up drawing very well. And there are some speed horses between him and Hades, but they all feel like horses that would really be on a, you know, on a borderline suicide mission if they want to be asked for the kind of speed that it's going to take to really push those two along. Um, so I envision it being a race that's run at a, you know, at an honest clip. And, um, and I think it'll set up well for anybody in just about any position, including the horses in the front end that, that are going to be where they want to be. Flower out. Right. They're great Go ride. Ahead. Nick against Bellamy Road and the Travers. Oh yeah, a little bit said you're not gonna. I'm not gonna let you go. I'm gonna keep you honest, and I think that's that's a great call uh, on on Johnny B. No love at all for any of the Fountain of Youth horses. Okay. It's... Oh, I mean, you want to talk about a bad performance from Fierceness? I mean, the Fountain of Youth was an eyesore. So uh, you know, I don't. I, Ladon Bro ran very well. I think that says more about the race in general than it does Ladon Bro. Um, especially because he was on the inside the whole way. And generally, you know, one and a half to two paths is where you want to be at Gulfstream. I'm not saying it was any kind of dead rail that day, but it's very hard to take any of those horses seriously. You know, we'll get a line on how these horses <laughs> run and and that'll give us a sense of maybe what Doorknock is when he runs in the bluegrass next week. But um, I mean, I would use Ladombro under. I, I, I'm willing to do that. I also think, but I'm saying Ladon Bro could be beaten by six lengths in here and run second if the real fierceness shows up. Um, I also advocated using Real Macho underneath. I thought he was too close last time. So I think he actually took the worst of it from a race flow perspective. But as far as winning, I'd be very surprised if either of those horses win. Well, yeah, me, tough to see. That's just a tough to see the founding. I, I will say this. I thought Frankie's empire, he was the one really compromised on the crawl. He was gaining ground on Ladon Bro, but it was like, you know, insignificant. It wasn't, it wasn't enough. I, I picked him third in here, just a, maybe a muck along third. Um, the Fountain Youth was just not a, not a real race. Let's just be perfectly honest with you. Yeah. Um, with all that we know what went, went on and, and, you know, they, they, they went about their business with, with door knock and, and uh, we'll figure that out next time with, with him, but tough to get excited about anybody out of there. Sometimes I watch the Fountain Youth replay and see if somebody's going to get scratched during the race. <laughs> uh, I'll try Conquest Warrior. I, I like that January 13th uh, maiden win. I mean, it certainly had all the trouble in the world and found a way to win that race. Uh, so I like horses that face adversity. Uh, this is a typical shug. Uh, you know, we're going to go from seven to one to a mount and eighth. And, uh, you know, he knows how to get one ready. And uh, the horse is progressive, I think, is going to get a setup, I think. Uh, yes, probably can't beat the real fierceness, but uh, I know we didn't see the real fierceness last time. So I I'm willing to bet against that that he shows up now. Uh, he's certainly not going to be 16 to 1 like he was in the uh, in the Breeders' Cup. So I think you have to bet against him right now. And if he shows up, that's fine. I'm okay with that. All right, I think we're about done. Any spot plays, gentlemen, on the card? Brian, go uh, for it. Yeah, Nick, thanks. Um, I'm going to throw a horse out in, in race four, and I can't believe I'm doing it, but oh, captain ran really good in a no-chance turf race last time. Off the layoff, he puts blinkers on. He's second off. He had a trip. I'm going to fool around with him early in the card. He's in race four. He's got a little class to him. I never thought by any stretch of the imagination he was a turf horse or a two-turn horse, for that matter. He ran pretty well in that spot. I'm going to come back to him and give him a shot in there. Nick, I got one for you. Race number nine. I'm going to go to the A, Dreaming of Kona, who yeah. is uh, is going to be a relatively big price. 
Um, turf to dirt. It's been a really good move for Aldana Spieth in terms of statistics. This horse has kind of taken the worst of it in three straight dirt tries. I think really hasn't gotten the ideal outside kind of chasing trip that he needs to be successful. Why not try him at a bit of a big price to get that uh, at the late half of the card started? I'm going to go race one, uh, try to get the card started off. I like first timers on big days and uh, Clement has a big firster in the, in the five and it's Grog. Uh, this horse is out of a dam that, uh, you know, was uh, won its first two starts on the grass and uh, he knows how to get one ready. I mean, he has a positive ROI with first timers on the turf the, of the ones that have raced. There's really not much in here that this horse has to beat. So the five, number five race, number one on Saturday, get that card kicked off uh, with uh, Clement first timer. Okay, we'd like to thank uh, Brian, thank Nick for this. Uh, any final thoughts, guys? Uh, just take a few rubber bands off the bankroll and fire on Saturday because, you know, we're all gamblers here. I, I know Nick, Nick knows this as well as anyone. These are the days where there's a lot of money in the pool. There's a lot of, the, if, if you're sharp, you should, you're supposed to have an edge on these days and uh, the pools will be huge, so get involved. Yeah, a lot of opportunity, no doubt about it. The uh... The fifth on the card is a really interesting maiden special weight race, and I'm looking forward to seeing what we get there. It's not the experienced horses that are interesting. There are some firsters in there that yeah. look like they're working up a storm, including Mindframe, who uh, Mike Rapoli has has hinted. Um, if you can you can bear with him on Twitter, he's hinted as a pretty pretty particularly good looking horse. So I'm intrigued by uh, by what we could see there. Well, thanks to the guys. Thanks to First Racing. Thanks to PTF for uh, missing the plane and uh, letting me host. So uh, we'll see you guys next time. It's been a great job, Mike. Money Media. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Mike. Nick, appreciate you guys.